Thank you. Good evening, uh, Galicia Jewish Muslim. My name is Elisa Gabi. I'm the president of the management board of, uh, of the foundation that runs the museum. And it's my honor and pleasure to welcome a uh, special guest tonight. Uh, uh, the uh, guests uh, include uh, the author, co-author of the book we have on our table, but we have the list of guests that is uh, uh, bigger than that, and I will follow the list uh, um, according to my notes. Uh, first of all, before I move to our special guest, uh, I would like to welcome the uh, um, official representative of the uh, Ukrainian consulate in Krakow, uh, the deputy consul, um, Maxim Muzichko. It's uh, our pleasure to host the representative of, uh, of uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, consulate here. Uh, second of all, I would like to welcome uh, Mrs. Uh, Natalia Fedushchak, who is representing uh, the Ukraine Jewish Encounter. It's our pleasure to host you here, and on this occasion I would like to thank you for being the um, initiator uh, of this meeting and being responsible for co-organizing organizing this, uh, this event. And absolutely not least, but last mention, is our special guest, um, Professor Paul Robert Magucci, Magucci. 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 I'm, I've been training the uh, <coughs> pronunciation, but it didn't work that well. well it's quite good. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's hard to compete with the um, great linguist and the person who speaks many languages. And our special guest uh, is uh, the co author of the book that is in front of you, all of you. Jews and Ukrainians, a millennium of coexistence, the book we are going to um, talk about tonight. Um, but to mention all the achievements of uh, Professor, it would be, um, it would take the whole evening. Uh, we spent um, almost an hour discussing uh, his work and I've learned so much, much more than any bio online can say uh, about his achievements uh, during his uh, academic career at various universities that included Princeton, Harvard, and right now the University of Toronto, where he's chairing the Ukrainian Studies uh, program. And uh, he's also um, a professor that was recognized by many universities all around the world especially in Europe, where, um, uh, which is also the center of his works, his books. Um, I've learned, and this is uh, really amazing, that uh, his uh, published text, his published works include around 800 items, including over 40 books translated to many languages. And today we have uh, two books that are standing on the table, and these are the two books uh, that uh, combine the history of Ukraine and Ukrainians and Jews, uh, which is uh, the book on, uh, we are going to talk about. Um, during the uh, preparation to our meeting, we have discussed also the whole process of Professor's work uh, that included um, not only his um, writing, but he is also involved in uh, cartography, uh, in um, all the sociolinguistics involved in the research that he's uh, conducting. And um, it's amazing uh, how uh, carefully he supervises all the publications of his books in many languages, including the corrections in Polish, in Czech, in Slovak, in Ukrainian, and who knows how many in other Turkish. languages. <laughs> Turkish. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Which I don't correct. <laughs> Except for the map. Except for the map. Okay, so um, it's our pleasure to host you today. And before I ask you for a few words of introduction, I would like to ask uh, Natalia for a few words of uh, presentation uh, before we start. Okay. 
Um, hello. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, Ukrainian Jewish Encounter is a nonprofit, privately funded Canadian organization. This is our 10th year in existence, and we've actually done quite a bit over this last decade. Uh, an important part of our work is what is called the Shared Historical Narrative, where we have brought together scholars from around the world you know, to talk about the Ukrainian Jewish shared history. Um, and these are, it's really from a very ancient time to contemporary times. We've participated in book fairs. In uh, last we had a very large project that was dedicated to the 75 year anniversary of Vabinyat. Professor Mangochi was actually the coordinator of that event. Um, and another large part of our work has been the production of publications. Jews and Ukrainians is a work that we are very proud of. Um, it is over two years in the making. Professor Mangochi will be able to speak more about this uh, work. And uh, I, you know, I think that uh, just from a personal point of view, this is a unique publication. And I live in the United States and it's really the first time that we see a work that is brought together, sort of a narrative of two people. I will not take up any more of your time. I invite you to please look at our website, ukrainianjewishencounter.org. Uh, the, uh, the address is on our bookmark. And so without further ado, Professor Makwichi. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And um, now um, I would like to uh, ask Professor Makwichi uh, to in tell a few words uh, of, uh, about the book, uh, about the um, whole idea of writing this book before I will express my uh, first um, remarks about the book, uh, which I already confessed I'm jealous of. Um, <laughs> I'm jealous of because uh, I would like to see the book like this, so uh, competent and so uh, compact about Poles and Jews, and also uh, the coexistence in the title. Thank you. Sorry, I can't speak in Polish. And it is a bit strange for me because I have never spoken in this part of the world in English. So this is my first experience speaking in English. And if I hesitate, it's because I haven't been hearing English in the last couple hours, or a couple days, I should say. Uh, and also I will try to speak in such a manner that people who are not native English speakers can follow my accent in that language. I have to say, like every one of us, believes that their form of the language that they speak is the correct one. Uh, and uh, there are, of course, various forms of speech in Poland, and there clearly must be a difference between the way you Galicians speak and those who speak in Warsaw. Uh, and certainly there is a difference between people in North America, uh, whether they're from the South or the West or the Northeast. Uh, so I feel that I am speaking the correct form of English, uh, especially since Everyone can understand it easily. Uh, the sm sm small uh, autobiographical note is that I am born, raised, and actually fully formally educated in the state of New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey is a part of the northeastern United States. New Jersey has a very big suburb uh, known as New York City. <laughs> uh, so, and it's quite close to where I was born, actually. I look at New York City, I shan't say I look down at it, but I look at it from my bedroom window when I was a young child. So that is the total amount of autobiographical information 
that I will share with you unless otherwise asked. Why this book, Jews and uh, Ukrainians? Perhaps I should begin by saying what this book is not. It is not a history book. And it is not a book about the history of Jews in Ukraine. It is rather a book about two peoples who for several centuries lived on the territory of what is today the present day independent state of Ukraine. Uh, having said that it's not a history of Jews in Ukraine, why not? Well, because both the title of the book and the organization that sponsored it, called the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, is concerned not with just Jews, but also with ethnic Ukrainians. As two equal peoples, both of whom have a long history, each of whom has a sophisticated culture, and if one wants to learn about one of these peoples, one has to learn about the other. And that applies not only to people of Jewish background, who either still live on the territory of the present state of Ukraine or live elsewhere in the world and are interested in their Jewish heritage from Ukrainian lands. Well, if they really want to learn about their Jewish heritage on <coughs> Ukrainian lands, they also have to learn about the dominant group who lived in those lands, namely ethnic Ukrainians. And by the same token, if ethnic Ukrainians and other non-ethnic Ukrainians, if anyone asks me the question why I am using that term, I will tell you, want to learn about uh, their own country, well, they should know about all the peoples and all the cultures that existed on the territory of their country and that belonged to the history of their country, Ukraine. And aside from themselves, ethnic Ukrainians, there were Jews, Russians, Poles, Crimean Tatars. It's all part of the history of Ukraine. Now, we are focusing here, however, only on two of those peoples that Jews and ethnic Ukrainians. Now, I said this book is not a book about the history of these peoples, but uh, this doesn't mean that we don't have a, a history of it. <laughs> There's a chapter on history here, and in fact, it is the longest chapter in the book, but it's only one of, cha of the chapters without preempting a question from uh, my distinguished colleague, the book is structured around themes, not chronology. Themes, not chronology. Themes uh, uh, such as geography, uh, physical geography, economic life, traditional culture, religion, language, belet, theater, architecture, art, music, special chapter on the diaspora, special chapter on life in contemporary Ukraine, and then the last chapter, reflection on the past and the future. And within each of these thematic chapters, 
we look at the evolution in each of those topics among ethnic Ukrainians and among Jews. And by the way, the book was structured deliberately that way so that if a reader picks this book up and wants to learn about Jews in Ukraine, well, they can learn about it, but they really can't learn about Jews in Ukraine without learning about ethnic Ukrainians in Ukraine because the narrative in many ways is so intertwined, which is the purpose of the book, or vice versa. If someone wants to know about the evolution of ethnic Ukrainians, they couldn't pick up this book and find things. And by the way, you know, in, in the English language, very rarely, it's next to impossible, are you going to find out about in English the developments in painting and sculpture among Ukrainians or music? It's very rare that you can find that, but yes, you can find that here. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe I will, uh, will stop here for the moment because I can see you're anxious to follow up on some of the things I've said. Uh, yes. So go to it, you, please. <laughs> We've had this dynamic in the, during the conversation before, and uh, I would like to follow on what you said, because you mentioned all the titles, all the uh, content, uh, how it's structured, and it's quite surprising. Uh, the structure of the book, it's not a historical book, it has the history, it has all these um, chapters that are not typical for uh, comparative history, even an overview of any other two nations, two ethnic groups. Um, so, how did you decide on the part of this book? Why did you include art and architecture? As, uh, why did you include the diaspora? Let me give you an anecdote and then an actual response, direct response. The anecdote comes from when Back in the 1970s, uh, an, a, 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 at Harvard University, uh, this was the period of the ethnic revival in the United States, and for that, a large grant was gotten from the Rockefeller Foundation by distinguished American historians to produce, for the first time, an, an ethnic encyclopedia of the United States. So encyclopedia, Harvard Encyclopedia of American Ethnic Groups, that's what it was called. And I was a, a member of the editorial board. And then subsequently, when I came to Canada, after a few years, I was a director of, of a so multicultural history society and decided as my gift to Canada and appreciation for that that I cre that create for Canada the equivalent which of course multicultural Canada which is all into multiculturalism has never actually produced an encyclopedia of the peoples of Canada so uh, 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 we conceived and produced a 1,500 large scale encyclopedia of Canada's peoples 130 people in both instances, most of the authors were historians. But you can't understand a given people purely from the perspective of political history or maybe even social history. People are not just beings that function in the historical world. They are Created, they create literature, they create music, or so forth and so forth. So if you really want to understand a given group, you have to understand all of them. And we used to have this problem with the, and, and when we set up a framework with actual topics that, and since we're paying them, they had to write what we wanted them to write, not what they wanted them to write. Uh, and that history was only one component. Now, if you're just talking about the diaspora groups, there's other kinds of questions, economic life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So from that standpoint, uh, this is quite natural to conceive of a book, a book of history, a, pardon, a book, it, it, trying to understand a given people and all aspects of that people. 
everything is history. I mean, just art is history. There's, there is art history. There is musicology. There is you know, the history of literature. Yes. So literally everything is history. And if you want to understand the totality and truly understand a given people, then you should, you should know many of these uh, or as many aspects as possible. This is uh, um, this leads to uh, the um, the interpretation of history that it's uh, much more inclusive. I would call it in the context of Polish historiography liberal because you talk not not only about the political history, political context, not only about the social history and uh, social dynamics but you also cover all the other areas that are discussing uh, ethnic groups. Uh, and I would say that uh, it, it's, it's a pity that um, given the knowledge we have, discussion about the ethnic groups very often omits music, culture, language, but also the dynamics between diasporas, which I found fascinating in this book uh, and uh, this is something that it's very often uh, skipped when we look at the relations between Polish and Jewish uh, groups or diasporas uh, mm -hmm. today. So um, I would like to also mention two perspectives because this book and uh, it's written by two authors. I just mentioned one author, I would guess, but also the second author, it's uh, Johannan Petrovsky Stern that we had the pleasure to host at Galicia Jewish Museum on other occasions. And this book uh, is not only the work of two scholars, but it's also, uh, it also offers two perspectives, I would say, combination of Jewish and Ukrainian perspective on various issues. And I would like to encourage you to look at the page number two. You have the copies in front of you. See, I actually like this already. This is like a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has the text. <laughs> yes. Everyone has the text, and now we are going to do textual analysis. Page two. Mm -hmm. Page two. And, you know, this is quite... Uh, challenging to start a book uh, from confronting uh, with confronting stereotypes, perceptions, and uh, misperceptions, and confronting like two perspectives: the Jews and the Ukrainians on some basic things, like Mil Milnitsky. Weren't you afraid to? Ah, to do this, yes. Okay, well, this is quite interesting uh, that you ask this question, uh, or you point this out, and thank you very much. I love perceptive readers, uh, and clearly you are a perceptive reader. Um, this actually was the last thing that was written in this book, which is very rare, uh, because normally I, um, I write my books from beginning to end, and I know what I'm going to say from beginning to end. I don't kind of skip around and then add the introduction or add it later on. May uh, I share the secret with the audience? All the books are handwritten, no computer. <laughs> That's amazing. That's correct. <laughs> With a cheap paper met pen, <laughs> which you change the refills. And I keep the pen as long as possible until it actually breaks. Uh, yes. But yes, this thing can be done, and it is done. So, um, the, yeah, this was the last thing that was added. Uh, and, and first of all, thank you very much for reminding us that this is, uh, uh, and that this would come out if, if one asks how the process took place. Uh, uh, this is a, a co-authored book. This is the first time I've ever written a book with somebody else. So this was also an experiment for me. Uh, fortunately, uh, Johann Petrovsky Stern and I 
not only kind of like each other as people, but we have uh, a natural understanding of the world in a similar manner. So we, we had actually <laughs> virtually no conflict whatsoever in terms of the content of, uh, of this book. After the text was finished, and if you ask, I'll tell you actually how we did that, but after the entire text was finished, uh, some readers um, of the text uh, were somewhat critical that we were, in some ways, as is said in English, sugarcoating or trying to avoid the serious problems and the serious issues. That in an effort, which I do in all of my writing, to not simply look at black and white, because history and life are just various shades of gray. There is no kind of absolute right and absolute wrong. There's no absolute truth, etc. I don't go so far as being a relativist, but nonetheless. Uh, and so the criticism of and the attempt at trying to uh, be as impartial, fair-minded, balanced as possible when dealing with not only the historical past, but other elements within religion, etc., that, that are very, could be very controversial, without any emotion. Uh, some readers thought that we were being too pussyfooting or, or, or being light and not being critical enough and not telling the story really how it was or you know, avoiding the real serious questions. So literally at the last moment, even though we have two authors, and this is no exaggeration, one afternoon I sat down and I thought of 10 stereotypes. If you have to have a number, I mean, you can go on forever. So I picked 10 stereotypes and I created them out of my head, you know, based on my experience, and I came up with this list uh, to sort of set the tone on the one hand that the rest of this book, we're not trying to cover anything up, these are issues, and effectively, this is how people generally th thought of each other, and still in some ways think of each other. That's, that's reality. And let's put it on the table up front. You put it on the table up front, and then you go to the rest of the book, and if people want to see how it evolves, whether these things are in fact misperceptions or stereotypes or so forth and so forth, let the reader then judge for him or her herself on the basis of reading the text. So that's how we got to doing this perhaps unorthodox approach. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, people, as part of history and certainly part of sociology, people do study opinions. <laughs> right? And these, are, these are opinions, perceptions. And this is something, when you open the book like this, this is something you expect. But uh, once you're getting the book, you expect it in the text, somewhere hidden. Uh -huh. So you look through the book and you yes. look for this stereotype. Right. You put it on the table right in front of the reader. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and then it can be relaxed reading. Some people love this, and some people don't like it. <laughs> hey, can't please everybody, as they say. You cannot. Um, and it's not only pleasing uh, Poles or Ukrainians or Jews, uh, not only pleasing, in this case, Ukrainians and Jews, it's also pleasing um, any other reader. And uh, I was wondering, um, you know, every author, when you write a book, you think a little bit about the reader. It's certainly not for the scholars, although it might inspire a lot of scholarship a lot of research. Um, who was the... Imagine? The audience. Audience. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the imaginary audience, or, or in fact, hopefully the real audience, and it is turns out to be the real audience, are, um, are certainly not professional scholars, regardless of the discipline. 
whether it's history or art or religion or theology, etc. Uh, it is written for the informed reader, informed person, who has, you know, a basic knowledge of, of various aspects of human civilization, um, and who happen to be curious and want to learn more about these particular, this particular issue. Uh, but it's also written in a very accessible manner. I mean, I have always tried in my life not only to practice it in the manner in which I write, but I also tell students. In fact, let me tell you a story. And this is also an anecdote, but it's important. And I see this young student over there smiling all the time, so it's good. When I'm helping a student formulate a paper, doing an outline before they go off and write, and they're tied up in the complications of the detail without seeing the larger picture. One of the things I say to them, the first thing you have to do is actually come up with a title of this paper. Come up with a title that's in five words, six words, that sums up the essence of what you want to do. You've got to do that first. And when you do that first, then you can have, then you can look at all the details. And I say to them, listen, guy, take your girlfriend out for dinner, for a drink, and you know, normal conversation. She says to you, well, what are you doing? I said, oh, I have to write this paper, you know, for this professor who's crazy, and you know, it's, it's so much work, and all this other kind of thing. And so the girlfriend asks, so what is it about? She has no clue. He should be able to explain to her in 10 minutes what he is writing about. And if he can't explain it in a language that she understands, who doesn't have a clue even about history or whatever, then he doesn't know what he's talking about. And don't hide behind techni technical terminology, which everyone in the academic world does, thinking that this is an impressive way to speak. Write simply. Write for a person that you can go out with at dinner who is not in your discipline and can explain it to you in a manner that you can understand. And that is the reader that I, we, because Petrovsky Stan understands this as well. He's a little bit more heavy handed on, on detail. It's, that's another thing, you know, the fight with detail. If you're writing something general, you know, you've got this, you, you've got this kind of inclination to tell it all. Well, no, you can't tell it all. Because if you try to tell it all, you're not going to get the message across. So you've got to take out things, and that's the battle. Absolutely. When you see the title, you, um, you are, I, I, at least I was wondering, how is it possible to cover all this complexity <laughs> in a big and heavy book, but still it's not uh, 1,000 pages, not even... 500, mm -hmm. and you managed to do it uh, uh, so wonderfully, uh, picking up on the most important issues, talking about ethnicity, uh, without the pathos, without uh, you know um, all these unnecessary theories, but explaining it to mm -hmm. a simple uh, reader as well. And I was wondering, uh, because the book is published also in Ukrainian, how it was received among Ukrainians in Ukraine or elsewhere? Yeah, this is always an interesting question uh, when you're writing about, uh, in this particular case, Jews uh, and, and Ukrainians, how the subjects of the book uh, and who people come from that particular culture, uh, how, they, uh, how they react. Uh, I think that, in general, 
And I'm going to ask my colleague Natalia to chime in here as well because she actually has, we've done a lot of presentations in Ukraine. The book has been reviewed. Uh, we know people who have read it. I'd be curious how, how, how she would answer the question. But I guess I would answer the question in the following way. Most Ukrainians, and here I'm talking not just simply about ethnic Ukrainians, I'm talking about the entire population of Ukraine. Uh, for that matter, uh, most Hungarians, uh, most French, most Italians, certainly Americans who don't know anything, don't know hardly much about their own culture. It's just because they live and were born and went to you know, elementary school and got some smattering of, of history or... I mean, how many Americans know about American art after, after having finished going to elementary school and secondary school? You know, the great American artists, Edward Hopper, or, you can name anyone. How many of you know that? I mean, hardly any. Now, I, I didn't say... Uh, notice I mentioned all these other people. I don't know about Poles. Maybe Poles are at a higher level. Maybe you know, you know your history and you know your culture better than... But most people don't know their own culture. And many, and I have met many Ukrainian readers who looked at this and said, geez, I didn't know about that. You know, this, this, I may know some things, this, but this, right? So, um, uh, th that's one thing. And the other thing is, the, at least the reader in Ukraine does understand, after reading the book, that this book is not for them. This is for the larger world. Any, for anybody in the world, and that it presents a fair-minded image of Ukraine. And Ukraine not simply, as is usually depicted, as a land of death and tragedy, huh? whether it's the problems of the Khmelnytsky uprising or, or uh, the Holodomor which killed millions and millions of people or World War II or Chernobyl uh, or, or shooting down a, an airplane that's flying from uh, where there was the Netherlands on to wherever it was going. You know, the first image is Ukraine Place of tragedy, people are dying, it, you know. Well, excuse me, these are only isolated instances over a period of over a thousand years, right? There's much more that's going on in this particular land as in any of the lands in which one lives, but that's not really spoken about. When they see this, in a sense, many feel that they are validated, that, you know, they come from a culture that is more than just tragedy and death. Yes, absolutely. But maybe, maybe Natalia but, has no, something to add. I have to agree. What is interesting for me is um, when we had the 75-year uh, commemoration of Bobinyan, uh, the Ukrainian language book of Jews and Ukrainians had um, come out, as did the Ukrainian language book of Bobinyan, which is a collection of uh, monographs uh, about Bobinyan before, during, and after. And there's a moment that uh, sticks out in my mind is that as I was coming up, we had this a bunch of people came, way. and we had a lot of young people were, were um, helping us. And at one moment, there were 15 young people, their heads all down, and they are engrossed in both of these books. One had Jews and Ukrainians open, the other had Babinyan open, and just the, the, the quiet. And the concentration, as they were reading, really just, you know, took me aback. And, and I said, well, so is it interesting? And they said, yes, we didn't know any of this. And so I would have to agree with Professor Makuchi that, you know, that this book, it does, I mean, Ukrainians are able to learn about themselves. It is a sense of validation, but there's a lot that you, young Ukrainians you know, even though they're of a generation 
that is born perhaps post Soviet Union, you know, they're still coming to learn about their history and they're proud of that history. And uh, so you definitely have this break very much today in Ukraine um, among a young generation of people feel a certain break of the past and a willingness um, to look forward and move towards Europe and to take on a certain uh, sense of, of those qualities, but really wanting to learn about their history and their culture. And, and that is very innovative. And that innovation is showing itself in, um, in many of the you know, young artists and all that are happening today. So. It seemed that the Council of Musicko wanted to add something. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm sorry, but I don't know whether my English is so good to express all of my feelings and express my point of view about that thing, but um, I will try easily, uh, word by word, I thank you myself. But you're absolutely correct and right about that uh, we had, and Mr. Professor also right, because we, have, uh, we are not a country of only tragedy or death, and we have a uh, uh, huge and all history. And, um, but in fact, uh, for almost a century, our country was turned apart, and our uh, young nation, uh, unfortunately, but uh, absolutely correct, do not know their history of mostly at all. But uh, when we are talking about uh, people, Ukrainians, and their knowledge of their own culture and uh, history. We should, um, we should know Ukraine, Ukrainian history and the part of this country. Because uh, informed more, and they know more about the culture and the history, Ukrainian history. And you're absolutely correct that when you're speaking, when you're speaking with uh, uh, Ukrainian citizens which are living in Kiev or in uh, Eastern Ukraine, uh, I will, I will repeat myself, but yeah, fortunately they do not know about their own history. So. And this was part of uh, uh, one of the reasons why I asked what was the perception of the book uh, in Ukraine, uh, because uh, we keep working with Ukrainian teachers, for example, Ukrainian students, and some of them have uh, wider knowledge, some of them a lesser knowledge on uh, <coughs> the history of Ukraine, but especially on the history and relations uh, with the Jews. So um, I, was, I was wondering how this was received. And uh, as I allowed one voice from the audience, there is uh, another uh, person who wants to speak, uh, Jason Francisco, who is uh, a professor and curator and a great uh, photographer who worked in Ukraine. Yeah, thanks. I, I uh, very much appreciate this book and this presentation, and I know um, Professor Petrovsky Stern myself, and I spent, as you just said, I spent quite a lot of time in Ukraine. Um, and to play the devil's advocate for a moment, uh, I think that, in my own experience, um, I think that the contemporary um, situation of Jewish heritage in Ukraine, in Western Ukraine specifically, is frankly appalling. And the, the physical patrimony that exists is in a terrible state of ruin and neglect. And I think there is a, um, a serious problem in the political culture of Ukraine that involves denial of Ukrainian participation in the Holocaust. And I'm interested to know what your, I understand this is not a political book, and that your goal is to emphasize a different kind of approach. Uh, but I think that it, it's, I mean, if we're talking about Ukrainian nationalist history and appreciating Ukrainian cultural accomplishments and economic accomplishments and historical accomplishments, then I think that automatically the question of Ukrainian responsibility, I don't mean guilt, but I mean Ukrainian responsibility for those Ukrainians who did participate in the Holocaust comes onto the table. So I wonder if you have comments about this, 
especially, or to put the question slightly differently, I wonder what you think of Omar Bartov's approach in his book, Erased, and how that book um, fits with your, your own approach. There are two things that, uh, that I understood from your comments. Uh, in part, uh, one may evolve from the other, but there are two separate things. I would say two separate things, and I'll try to address them separately. One is uh, the cultural heritage and the, the physical remnants of a heritage and how it is being preserved or not preserved. So that's one subject. And then the other is the general attitude or the perceived general attitude among large among among the Ukrainian population toward uh, the their historical past or the historical path of events that took place on the territory of Ukraine, and in this particular case, if you're asking specifically the period of the Holocaust and the degree to which local populations in Ukraine uh, cooperated with or didn't cooperate, collaborated with or didn't collaborate with an occupying power. So these are two, I view these as two separate points. On the first point, and that is the preservation of cultural artifacts that are left behind, my impression of uh, Ukraine is, is that in many ways, yes, this is true, that cultural artifacts are not being taken care of in the manner that they should be. But this is not limited to Jews. One gets turned on by Jews and one then looks and say, well, look, you look, look, look at Jewish cemeteries, they're not being taken care of, or synagogues are falling apart. Well, we know that certainly during the early period of a new state, which is preoccupied with a whole host of issues of, in some ways, survival, doesn't take care of monuments that deal with ethnic Ukrainians, or former buildings that were centers of ethnic Ukrainian culture. Or well, for that matter, how much money would the government of Ukraine be willing or able to invest in the preservation of the Mennonite settlements on the island of, uh, of Khortitsa uh, in, the, in the middle of, uh, uh, of the Dnieper River? Um, or, for that matter, and I actually traveled around in those military cemeteries from World War I in which soldiers who died, uh, Austro-Hungarian soldiers or German soldiers, in this case Austro-Hungarian soldiers who died and go to their cemeteries, which I actually did back in the 90s, and we did the same kind of thing. I'm walking around with it. It was, it was an organization of primarily young people uh, from Austria who are concerned with the heritage of their young men who died during World War I and whose cemeteries you can't even find. And if you find them, you know, tombstones are thrown here, thrown there. Exactly the same kind of thing that Omar Bartov describes in his book regarding Jewish cemeteries. So yes, I've seen Jewish cemeteries like that, and I've seen cemeteries of Austro-Hungarian uh, Austro soldiers like that. And I've seen the remnants and destruction of Mennonite culture on, on Khortitsa Island. Namely, this is a reflection of the state of Ukraine, which is a new country, and that is not investing money and maybe a lot of that money was ripped off for the first 20 years by oligarchs, and we all know about this, right? Not investing money in, in pre preserving the cultural past or heritage of anybody, including their own 
ethnic Ukrainian cultural heritage. Now that's begun to change a little bit, but for the most part, stop and think about this. If you go to Ukraine today and you travel the landscape in terms of restoration of buildings, or new buildings, so forth, the most important and the most visible that you're going to see, fixing up, rebuilding, destroyed, are churches, Orthodox and, and Greek Catholic. Is the money coming from the government of Ukraine to fix these churches? No, it's not. If you go to Khortitsa Island, you'll see some reconstruction of Mennonite remnants. Well, that's money's coming from the Mennonites in, 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 in central Canada, in Manitoba. Ukraine's position has been all along, you know, you want to fix up something, raise the money and be my guest. You're not going to get it from the central Ukrainian government because they don't think in those terms enough yet. So, my, my answer to this is, again, let's place let's look at the larger picture and not just single out one thing and simply say, oh, that must be an indication of anti-Semitism because none of the Jewish cemeteries are fixed. Well, if some of them that do get fixed, and they do, or that some of these Austro-Hungarian ones get fixed, one can only talk about being anti-German or anti-Austrian is if they break those things down again. And the same thing with some Jewish cemeteries that have been restored, or synagogues that have been restored. Uh, as if they're blown up again, or if they're attacked again, etc. And this then raises the other question of the contemporary level of, if not anti-Semitism, which, by the way, you know, what is anti-Semitism? What kind of forms are we talking about? And what is the record of Ukraine in the context of Europe? Well, in the context of Europe today, one of the most anti-Semitic countries is France. Uh, and, you know, there are statistical data on the basis of, you know, incidents allegedly of anti-Semitism. Um, with regard to the historical past and the role of memory and the desirability of recognizing uh, the role that the inhabitants of Ukraine, regardless of their national origin, uh, may have played in cooperating with occupying authorities during World War II. There's a whole section here on collaboration, by the way. So we do address that matter up front in this book. Um, and in terms of present-day attitudes or present-day desires, uh, to, uh, uh, to avoid speaking about those matters? Well, again, I don't know. Uh, on the pages of one of the most respected intellectual publications in Ukraine, which is a journal called Kritika, this whole question of Ukrainian participation, uh, participation, and let me be very clear here, notice I slipped just now, Participation of residents in Ukraine uh, it, um, during World War II, which is different from Ukrainian in the sense of ethnic Ukrainian, but the participants of residents in, in, in Ukraine uh, in cooperation with the occupying uh, Germ uh, Nazi German authorities, these matters are discussed by serious scholars, and they're not, they're not whitewashed. Uh, so it's not like uh, when we can, we can just simply say, oh, Ukrainians, Ukrainians or Ukraine doesn't want to know about this. They want to forget this part of the past. This is simply not true. Um, so that's how I would answer or, or respond to your, uh, your intervention. There's one word uh, that uh, was uh, missing here is the continuity. Uh, continuity of the group, continuity of the material traces of other groups, other residents of, uh, of the land. And uh, if uh, in the book you follow certain idea with some continuity, so we can look through the history of uh, um, um, art, 
uh, architecture. And I think the image uh, in the book might be surprising for some readers. I was thinking about uh, the image from Polish perspective. And at some point, I think the image of Ukrainian-Jewish relations in Poland is a little bit different than it's presented in the book. I think we demonize uh, it a little bit uh, here. Well, uh, I can't speak for Polish historiography or, more importantly, attitudes in Polish society, um, because I simply don't know enough. I guess the only thing I would say is, is that I do have I do have sympathy and understanding for those Poles and for that matter those Ukrainians in Ukraine, Poles in Poland, who may feel that they have had a history, and certainly in the 20th century, both countries, both societies, in particular during World War II, of enormous <coughs> suffering, enormous suffering, <coughs> enormous destruction. And that in the outside world, in an often flippant and superficial manner on the part of those who think they know something about this part of the world, do not gloss over the <coughs> suffering of the people in both of these countries and only focus on the negative aspects, it could be Jews, could be others, at the expense of, at the expense of, a, of, of a, a true understanding of these, of what went on. So for instance, I'm going to touch on something that, that I've heard about, uh, which causes a problem, and that is a flippant term like Polish concentration camps. Now that can appear in English in publications. Well, quite frankly, if I read that and I was a Pole, I'd be upset. Oh, excuse me, I'm not a Pole. <laughs> I, I, I am upset because there was no Polish concentration camps. There were concentration camps and death camps on the territory of the Third Reich. There was no Poland in, during World War II. This was the Third Reich, an integral part of it. However, people will say, oh, they're in Poland today, right? So, you know, you write in the newspaper, or other, the Polish concentration camps. This, this, is, this is unfit, not unfit, it's just simply incorrect, and therefore I can have sympathy for those who react to that. How they react, how they want to change it, that's a different story. You know, we can agree or disagree, but the principle, I think, deserves attention. Yes, that's true, and I, I'm glad you added uh, the um, correct and accurate uh, statement that there were no Polish camps, and uh, I would also specify or add that, in fact, it was occupied Poland, never the integral part of the Third Reich, although the general government uh, seemed to be like a semi-German state or semi-part of the, the Third Reich. But this is for another discussion and uh, for another uh, um, hour uh, or another day of talking about what was the history of uh, uh, Poland. Um, I would like. Well, more to importantly, how to describe it in another language, in another culture, using the correct terminology. 
That's really what the problem is, and not simplifying terminology. Absolutely, uh, not to simplify it, not to simplify the history, and also not to simplify the image of uh, the other group, mm -hmm. whatever uh, um, stereotype we have, whatever the uh, perception we might have, trying to understand the deeper than it is on the surface, it's always the goal of any anybody who is cu curious and anybody who is interested in the topic. And I think the readers of your book get a lot of uh, ideas, uh, new ideas that um, sort of uh, inspire them to look further because this is the book that really uh, provokes people to uh, ask questions. It's not the book that gives all the answers, although it may uh, look like, but it inspires uh, some more questions than, uh, that are addressed than are addressed in the book. So uh, I wonder if there are any other questions from the audience to the author. It's the unique chance to ask the question or share the comment. Uh, I would be curious to find out actually how you both professors, how you share the work, how you work on it, how you, how you decide to split. Ah, yeah, okay. It's okay to Yeah, me. good. Um, yes, how, how two authors wrote the book together. Quite interesting. <coughs> Um, the, the first thing was is that we, we spend a day or so talking about the concept, what this was going to look like. We both agreed from the very outset that this was A, not going to be about a history of Jews in Ukraine, it's going to be about the two peoples, and also that not a chronological history, but rather a book that was going to be comprised of different thematic chapters that in some ways try to depict in a semi-encyclopedic fashion all aspects of the uh, society. Uh, one thing was actually left out of here <laughs> in terms of the arts, which we didn't include, uh, and I think it's a shortcoming, is, is cinema. I mean, there's a lot of cinema, both with Jewish themes, let alone the Ukrainian cinema, sent the cinema, and there, there isn't anything in the cinema, but otherwise we tried to cover the, the gamut. After we, uh, after we uh, decided on what the thematic chapters were going to be, we had another challenge, and the other challenge was is, is that this was supposed to be a small-scale book. I've done some small-scale books, <coughs> the Crimean Tatars, um, some other peoples, uh, and uh, this, this book was supposed to be like 160 or 180 pages. Maybe. And in order to do that, if you're going to have 12 thematic sections, well, it's very simple. So you divide, the, you know, what's the total number of pages divided into 12? Well, it soon became clear that this was not enough pages. So we then in one sense, threw up our hands and said, the heck with it. We're just going to write as, write as we think is necessary, uh, not go too crazily, but nonetheless. So in effect, the book became two or almost three times size than was the original plan. How then did we do it? Um, well, uh, my colleague, Johan petrovsky Stan is a specialist on on jewelry in general, and certainly in Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, with a very heavy uh, commitment to uh, Jewish religion, etc. He's an observant uh, 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 Jew, uh, and Orthodox, he's an observant Orthodox Jew. And uh, I, uh, and so, and I know something about uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian matters. Um, I certainly there's some things I didn't know anything about. I mean, for me to write this thing on traditional culture, which is folklore and ethnography, I mean, you know, I had a, it was a learning curve, as they say, and I had to send it out to my colleagues you know, who were ethnographic specialists, etc. I'm a little bit better in music and in, and in art, but not in that. Um, in any case, um, I wrote, we had these 12 chapters. I wrote the sections on 
that dealt with ethnic Ukrainians. He wrote the sections that, uh, 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 that dealt with Jews. That was the basic division. There were some instances when I wrote the sections on Jews of, of an area of Ukraine that I know a little better than he does. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I didn't, he wanted, he's a literary specialist, so he wanted to write the section on Ukrainian, uh, uh, on Ukrainian literature as well as Jewish literature. On the other hand, I know something about sociolinguistics and how to explain language, so I wrote the, the section on Hebrew and Yiddish language as well as on Ukrainian language. So, but generally, generally, he did the stuff on the Ukrainian component, and I did, uh, pardon, on the Jewish side, and I did on the Ukrainian. So we had actually two separate manuscripts, right? More or less the same size. And then, actually, I am both co-author, but I am editor of the body. Because then the next stage was my job, especially since it was being done in English, which is my native language, I had to take the two sections and meld them. Right? So, that they, so that there was a, an easily readable narrative of these two portions. And that, you know, in some cases was a straightforward thing, in some cases was a somewhat creative thing, we had to make some corrections and so forth. But that's how we did it. And then all along, which was the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge of all, all along when we had a manuscript, both of us had a manuscript, we were already thinking, and had to be thinking, of how we're going to illustrate this. So when you're writing something, oh, it would be great to have an illustration of this, or an illustration of that. We already started marking it within our manuscript, of course, where we would want some illustration. But the illustration portion, which is the most complicated portion of any book that has illustrations, takes far much more time than writing text. Writing text is easy. But picking illustrations, finding them, the right one, da -ba -da -ba -da. so we actually hired somebody to uh, find the illustrations. We supplied a list of, let's say, well, there were, again, over 300. We wanted, we wanted 300 illustrations, and, you know, we want this building, or we want a scene like this. Go find it, right? And so then this person whom we hired to, to collect the photographs it turned out to be not the most ideal resolution of the thing, so, but we got a bunch of photographs, what, about 200 of his, and then we had to add the rest, right? And then lastly, not lastly, but simultaneously, were the maps. There are, I think, I don't know, 27 maps here. Most of them, some of them came from some of my atlases, or based on some of my atlases, or based on my history of Ukraine. Some of them were brand new. Uh, I did all of the maps, because I, um, that's one of the things that I do in life. Uh, so that's how we, that, that, that's how we created this thing together. And as I said, uh, remarkably, we had no, you know, it just flowed, uh, no, uh, no problem. Once we read, it, it's really hard to hard to uh, distinguish the moment uh, the moments that you switch from one author to another. It's so uh, so fluent uh, going from. I write in black, but I read and edit in red, <laughs> and my hand is very heavy. <laughs> Actually, didn't you have that experience? My colleague here from your university, Agalonian, was uh, in. Uh, was in Toronto for a couple months and she gave a public presentation in, and it was in English and, uh, and so she saw the work of my red pen. <laughs> uh, we have the time for the last question, if there is any. The last and only chance to ask a question. Maybe from a more like beginner perspective, um, this is not good for the last question, but I wonder why you chose coexistence. Uh, mm. And would it be possible to choose a stronger word, a like more fusional uh, thing? And would it be possible to write such a book on that? Uh, to me, coexistence is something that evolves side by side with little interaction. Uh, but was there more than that? 
Very good question. Uh, this did this did uh, uh, come <coughs> up. Uh, people had asked about it. Uh, I have to say that the title of a book, and you may remember, I said before, I say to my students all the time, it's very good to start off in the beginning of what your what your title is, and then uh, because it helps to 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 keep you focused. This the. Some might also say, why is it Jews and Ukrainians and not Ukrainians and Jews? <laughs> By the way, it's another thing. Um, I don't know. Jews and Ukrainians just came to mind. <laughs> you know. And then, by the way, it sounds better in English. Ukrainians and Jews. And Jews. So, there are all of these elements that are A coexistence, I thought, was the... most neutral and somewhat reflective of reality because both of these peoples lived in the same place. And in that sense, they existed together. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily that they interacted together. In some cases they did, and in some cases they didn't. But they certainly existed in one place. So, and, and it's a term also that carries no particular negative, positive baggage. It's just, it's just saying that here is a territory, two peoples existed on it, and that's it. It's not suggesting or implying something else. But did you, in the opening part of your question, say, well, why not call, why couldn't it be called something else? Did you have another word? I didn't, no, no. okay, fine. Well, so, so, so then I would, as usual, I would say, well, if it's not coexistence, what do you think it could be? Okay, so coexistence for me, and I just realized, because you put a religion, a world religion, next to uh, a country, I mean, how great Ukraine it is, it doesn't have the same value as a religion, so we complain culture, country, we have a religion. And then we talk about coexistence. Well, I, I've seen coexistence written, but for example, we talk coexistence between Muslims and Jews. Mm -hmm. I've never seen coexistence used when we use culture and religion. So, uh, excuse me, you don't see coexistence between Jews and other non-Jews in the society in which they live? Is that what you're saying? There's a lack of interaction? Well, coexistence for two religions, for me it makes sense, but coexistence between a culture and a religion, because to me I assimilate uh, Jewish people as a religion, um, so coexistence of a religion and a culture it's more than coexistence because there must be more than that. Okay, well, you know, let's, uh, uh, I, was, uh, I would answer that and say let's not get caught up of, 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 with the word culture here in, with regard to, to religion, co uh, religious coexistence. Uh, if, I would just simply say this, which may or may not be in, an, an answer to what you're getting at, but yes, Jews and Christians have a religious divide. And it's a religious divide in anywhere in the world and, and in Europe where Jews and Christians lived. However, in some parts of the world, including Ukraine, those two religions actually did coexist. It was completely and totally normal for Jews to, let's put it to start off, Christians to recognize and accept the Jewish Shabbat as a day of rest for Jews, and vice versa for Jews to recognize Sunday as a day in which there is both 
part religious activity in which which uh, uh, which Christians follow but they have needs on Sunday and part of their needs on Sunday is after church to relax and maybe do some shopping or by the same token the Jews on Friday night and Saturday is if if they were Orthodox observant Jews which virtually all Jews in Ukraine were they couldn't work they couldn't pick up the wood. They couldn't do anything. And so they needed somebody to do this. It was completely normal to have the goy. To, to, you know, that's, that's what they do on, on Friday night and Saturday. And this is what the Jew does on Sunday. Sells them, you know, in the marketplace goods that they want to buy. Now, what good, greater example is this of two religions coexisting, uh, one next to the other? Let alone numerous examples of Christians who had a problem in their lives and would go to the local tzaddik or rebbe and consult with him, rebbe, what should I do? Uh, or by the same token, the Baal Shem Tov, who founded Hasidism, not only actually did deal with a lot of Christians, but picked up a lot of traditions, in particular from the Hutzels in Western, you know, different studies about this. So the interaction between, at the, then we have the scholarly level, you know, well, well-known rabbis or uh, would interact with well-known Christian scholars and discuss theological matters, etc. I mean, did these things, that's, to my mind, ultimate coexistence. They, they, they live on the same territory, they, they function in, entire, in one level an entire uh, philosophical, theological difference, but at the same time they, fun they interact by the needs of their bodies and their existence in the physical space. Thank you so much. Uh, I would uh, only add that uh, this book is much more than uh, the coexistence of two religious groups. It's uh, um, the coexistence on many levels of two ethnic groups, two national groups, uh, and uh, uh, you can discuss it in various ways. Um, also, um, I would uh, just um, uh, finish with the, uh, with the uh, word coexistence because this is uh, the, the key to the book. It's focusing on this existing together and trying to exist together. Uh, however, the book doesn't, um, doesn't skip, doesn't avoid discussing the moments when the coexistence was difficult, when the coexistence was harsh and challenging. Uh, and I think this is one of the uh, elements that is also important. It's not the uh, sugarly image. However, sometimes one may have this impression, but uh, then you read the chapters that are difficult and, and you verify your opinion. Um, so uh, I know that some of you are already holding the book, ready to run and read it at home. But mm -hmm. if you want to have uh, the signature of the co-author, uh, you're welcome to stay and uh, talk a little bit longer. Thank you so much, Professor Maguchi, for uh, being here. And thank you so much for coming for this meeting and Natalie for, for, the, for co organizing this event. And my also, uh, as, uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for not only coming here, uh, but raising the questions that you had, uh, but in particular, uh, my my new colleague that I've met now for the first time, uh, uh, Ms. Aditha, uh, who actually I didn't hire her uh, <laughs> to to do this. I just met her a, a half hour before we came into the door. Uh, but I really like this kind of person. This is one of the best sessions that I have had, and I have done many of these. First of all, this is a person who read the text, thought about it, and came up with all the appropriate questions. So, actually, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.